ladies and gentlemen, let us heartily welcome uh, Professor Premesh Lai. Thank you very, very much, Pumla. And I want to thank uh, Professor Gobodo Marikezela for this wonderful invitation. Uh, it's the second time I'm speaking at Stellenbosch, and I'm very grateful to, to be hosted by, by this center. And she speaks of our center with, with great flair, but this is an illustrious center. Uh, so thank you very much for, for, for the invitation. I also want to thank uh, Landy Manning for just the amazing organization. I managed to find my way to Stellenbosch and into a parking bay. Yes. So, <laughs> so, so that's a feat for me. I mean, where are, you know, the people who don't trust my ability to find parking yeah. lots and, and to get into this, let alone. Um, I want to dedicate today's lecture to a colleague and a friend of all of us in Cape Town, uh, Professor Harry Garuba, who has just passed away. Um, and, you know, two, three years ago, Harry and I were part of a conversation around a global humanities curriculum. And I remember the great insight that he brought to that conversation, great care and thought. Uh, and I really think, you know, that that's the temperament we must cultivate. And I wish there would be more young graduate students who would encounter Harry. Um, but, you know, in the wake of Harry's passing, I want to say that, you know, we have a, an obligation to hold on to Harry's memory. And so I want to think of today's lecture as an opportunity to share a conversation with Harry Garuba. And I, as I was writing this, I was wondering what Harry might say uh, in his acerbic criticism with his wry smile and, and an offer of a glass of wine. Yeah. <laughs> so in, 1980, uh, in 1896, a theatrical work titled Au was performed on a stage of Théâtre de Louvre in the French capital of Paris. The play drew widespread condemnation, not least because its writer, Al Alfred Shari, had purposefully set out to offend the bourgeois sensibilities of Parisian theater audiences. By all subsequent accounts, Jerry's wager to offend the dominant public sensibilities of his time proved successful. In fact, the play's success was so pronounced that it was shut down after its first performance. <laughs> 100 years later, at the Market Theater in Janusburg, Jarry's central character, the oafish, grotesque, and ridiculous figure of Ubu, was reincarnated in a theatrical production written by Jane Taylor and William Kentridge and performed by the Handspring Puppet Company. Ubu and the Truth Commission was an effort to trouble an otherwise complacent audience about the fate of reconciliation at the end of apartheid, mocking how those who were once complicit in the violence of a racial formation had become mere spectators in its unraveling. In the drama of the times, Uber and the Truth Commission called into question how the trauma of the past, painfully conveyed in the testimony of victims of human rights abuses, was worryingly served up as dinnertime televisual soap opera. By turning to Jerry as a source of inspiration, Taylor and Kentridge were effectively contesting the hegemony of the televisual by suggesting that freedom would be better served by a theatrical politics. Ubo and the Truth Commission recall the century-old tradition of theater that is widely acknowledged for having kept alive the dream of freedom under conditions of the 20th century's catastrophic world wars, predominantly through providing a resource for popular politics, artistic practice, and critical theory. The two productions on either side of the long 20th century are exemplary, exemplary of a form of theater that Martin Essen labeled the theater of the absurd. Absurdism is about facing the world in which nothing seems to make sense, and about embracing the fact that our lives can be both terrifying and ridiculous. It is a form of theater that leaves us with the troubling uncertainty of not knowing whether to laugh or cry. In keeping with the genre of the theater of the absurd, both plays aim to shock the audience out of their comfort zones, while making the theater the site for testing ideas of equality and democracy. We might call this an effort at creating a theatrical politics that went against the idea of democracy as the rule of experts proposed and espoused by Plato. Theatrical politics aims to remake freedom by activating the popular spirit of the demos and its nascent public spheres. Beyond the obvious repetition of the figure of Ubu, successive generations of playwrights, including Wally Shoinka and Jane Taylor, turned to absurdism to lay claim to the idea of freedom 
by way of a theatrical technique that sets its sights on ridiculing the excesses of power. Perhaps it is this promise of recasting freedom and unleashing the demos that resulted in an exuberant global reception of Ubu and the Truth Commission as it continues to form uh, a part of the theatrical politics initiated by Alfred Sherry in 1896. In fact, the performance both inaugurated the onset of South African democracy and later to mark its 20th anniversary. However, seeing this production 20 years after it was first performed across the length and breadth of South Africa where it was widely hailed, I was left with a nagging feeling about the efficacy of the play in conjuring an image of post-apartheid freedom. Allow me to sketch the broad outlines of its narrative arc um, so that, that I might be able, so that I might lend uh, a, a reading, lend this paper to a reading of the failures and shortcomings of the Truth Commission. Shortly after the first hearings into the human rights violation, into human rights violations, Ubu and the Truth Commission addressed the paradoxes that had formed around a commission established to record, report, and indemnify testimony of victims and perpetrators, perpetrators of gross human rights violations under apartheid in South Africa. Inadvertently, the play reframed the TRC by inviting us to look beyond the victim-perpetrator distinctions towards anticipations of what I'm calling theatrical politics, in which post-apartheid political subjectivity could be reconciled with post-apartheid freedom. In short, then, Ubu and the Truth Commission deploys the technique of slapstick and comedy to call attention to the limits of a concept of reconciliation as a foundation of the national narrative in South Africa. By staging a collision between the competing demands of conflicted lovers whose pasts recall the racial divides of apartheid, the play sets out new parameters for thinking beyond reconciliation into what freedom might mean under post-apartheid conditions. Formed around a narrative that glances at the past, enacted through excerpts from TRC testimony that are mediated through the emotional prosthesis of the puppet on the one hand, and on the other, a story of interracial love between a former security branch agent performed by David Minar as Pa Ubu and Busi Zokufa as Ma Ubu, the play is itself split between a story of the testimony delivered to the TRC and an interracial love affair where the very desire for reconciliation is brought to a crisis. On this read, the production parodies a text, Anki Crock's Country of My Skull, about a romantic interracial romance set against the backdrop of the unfolding testimony of the TRC. Only this time, in the theatrical performance, the love affair that undergirds the fantasy of reconciliation is threaded through the medium of slapstick, comedy and theater of the absurd in recalling a diminished role assigned to the creative disciplines in the project of reconciliation and by extension freedom, the play must perhaps be viewed as a cautionary tale about what the TRC cannot see about the limits of its own ambitious undertaking. In the crossover of tragedy and comedy, the play sets out how a fantasy of an interracial love affair would prove to be hopelessly inadequate as a foundational fiction for forging an imagined political future in the wake of apartheid. But there is a second level at which the play's referentiality operates. By drawing on a theatrical tradition that Alfred Jury introduced in 1896, Ubu and the Truth Commission helps us reach deep into the discourses of the TRC, only to reveal how its own desire for reconciliation lies not in the legal precedent established by the rules of amnesty that calls the commission into being, nor even the humanist precursors by which uh, apartheid was opposed, but somewhere else. Scouring the archive of the TRC, Ubu and the Truth Commission sets out the terms by which the commission unwittingly falters, and the terms by which it must, for all intents and purposes, ultimately be redeemed. Ubu and the Truth Commission reckons with the South African political transition by tracking the spiral of uncertainty surrounding the unforeseen contradictions in the translations of truth and reconciliation. The two iterations of Ubu are linked through a symbolic spiral emblazoned uh, on the torsos of the grotesque figure after whom the play is named. And you'll see that both in Jerry and in uh, 
uh, Taylor and Kendridge's production, the spiral is, is a motif that carries through. Those of you who have seen the exhibition at Zeitzmacher will know how central the spiral is. Um, and, and of course, there's a, there's a symbolic reckoning with uh, the Dadaism movement that uh, Kentridge has been so interested in, and sometimes overlooked in the, in the commentary on William Kentridge. But in this production, this spiral is something that is worth taking hold of and, 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 and considering uh, in relation to the questions that the, this production poses. The plot then intrudes on the, pri on the private lives of Mao Ubu and Pao Ubu, who in their interracial union reveal the collisions spawned by the entanglements of love in an apparatus of torture, murder, and unreflective political allegiance. The instrumentalities of state power are given over to Miles the Crocodile. I've got a little image of Miles the Crocodile there somewhere. There we go. Given over to um, the instrumentalities of the puppet Miles the Crocodile and the dogs of war who become accomplices to a hideous spectacle of a lover's quarrel. Maubu's suspicion of sing sexual indiscretion on the part of Pao Ubu soon turns out to be an elaborate plot of suppressing state secrets. The medium of the animated puppet is thus used as a prosthesis to discard, retrieve, reveal, and hide official secrets of state violence in a game of morality pitted against the shattered fantasy of unfettered love. As a testimony to the biopolitics of apartheid's modernity, the play stages a conflict of forms. It is a conflict between the tragedy derived from the testimony delivered to the TRC and the comedy of slapstick. We might say that it is a tension between the kinesis of the puppet and cinematic memory. Confession and testimony are thus each distinguished by discord over the scattered remains of love and revolution after apartheid. To mark the specific feature of interplay and discord, consider a sequence from the play that sheds light on the field of collision, which the TRC was established to circumvent in the making of a national narrative. And so I just want to show a brief clip from the play so that you have a feel for, that's the, the two characters, Ma Ubu and Pa Ubu. Um, and I think what I need to do here is that. I was told it's going to work. It's not working. Nandi's here. Nandi, help. Okay, there we go. Oh, my God. 
exclusive day. Oh, so the tubing thing. So we we'll take an inner tube and put it like over the face of the Jimmy. Uh, inner bunk and drag it with the soft on the bunk. We cut a slit in the tube for the tongue. Or slay a split to be by the bunk at the top. This is how we got the tube. This was a bad girl. Okay, I'm going to pause it there. Uh, Ma Ubu is now discovering that Pa Ubu was not involved in any act of sexual indiscretion, but was in fact a state security agent and uh, was suppressing secrets in the midst of their uh, failing love affair. So as a representation of the TRC, Ubu and the Truth Commission draws on an aesthetic tradition of absurdism that for all intents and purposes emerged in the midst of the threat to the idea of freedom in the 20th century. Shari was not only the precursor for the formation of art movements such as Dadaism, Surrealism, or the precursor to the cinematic genre of slapstick that Charlie Chaplin fa uh, made famous, but also central to the theatrical tradition that links to Beckett, Shoyinka, and more recently, Taylor and Kentridge. This vast paradigm shift that Shari's play inaugurated was precisely the kind of resources that supported Walter Benjamin's in search for an idea of freedom on the cusp of the rise of European fascism. The connection is meticulously set out in Benjamin's 1929 essay, The Last Snapshot of the European Intellectual. Concerned that the European intellectual had lost sight of the idea of freedom, Benjamin noted that the Surrealists of his time had kept the idea alive. For Benjamin, the Surrealists did not seek to resolve the liberal conundrum of freedom, but to stage a revolt so that freedom is turned into a life-affirming resource of an aesthetic education. Art, thus understood, was always on the side of those who opposed authority and power. Benjamin was particularly intrigued for, uh, by the use of humor and absurdism in the work of the Surrealist artists specifically. For example, Miriam Bratu Hansen's study of Benjamin's relation to the cinematic experience and the rise of fascism suggestively revisits a debate about technology, mass culture, and catastrophe that helps to clarify Benjamin's views on aesthetics and freedom. Hansen lays bare the stakes of a disagreement between Benjamin and Adorno on the relationship between humor and catastrophe, and whether the flip side of, of slapstick might affirm a new attitude to technologies of power that break from the proscribed and regulated pseudo-aesthetics of fascism. Hansen rearticulates Benjamin and Adorno's effort to make sense of what they called Mickey Mousing in the midst of the impending rise of fascism in Germany. If caricature is permitted for such a complex and nuanced debate and reflection, we should, at the very least, consider Adorno's caution about the macabre element of slapstick as precisely that which launched Benjamin's effort to multiply its effects. Benjamin's effort may be read as a tactic to counter the deadening of the human sensorium that accompanied the rise of post-World War I mechanization of industrial capitalism. If Mickey Mouse encapsulated the German popular spirit of the 1930s, Benjamin sought to anticipate how it was not only the site of a possible break in the timing of the formal principle of the assembly line in industrial capitalism, but also a reckoning with a shock that could potentially awaken the senses. The motif that Benjamin mobilized in this depleted sensory script, Hansen informs us, is the way Mickey Mouse and Chaplin open room for play, even as they register the experience of unprecedented human alienation. On this reading, it is clear that Hansen finds in Benjamin's forays into slapstick the very conditions for retrieving a concept of freedom from the accretion of a memory of violence. This theatrical tactic is perhaps located in the mechanization of industrial capitalism and the rise of fascism that a new technological emergence buoyed in the first half of the 20th century. It is becoming increasingly evident that Benjamin's recuperation of an idea of freedom among the Surrealists aligns with Jacques Rancière's more recent understanding of theatrical politics. Drawing inspiration from the Paris Commune of the mid 19th century, Rancia has undertaken to massively overhaul our understanding of aesthetics through what he calls a reconfiguration of the perceptible. For Rancia, theatrical politics allows for a blurring of the distinction between those who look 
and those who act. Theatre thereby rearranges the terms by which we come to partake in political life. For the purposes of my argument, it is important to grasp the manner in which Benjamin may have found in the Surrealists the same sense of freedom that Rancia finds in theatrical politics. Both create an aesthetic on the move, almost akin to the movement of the cinema that is spectacular, contingent, improvisational, and disruptive. Rancia seeks a freedom enabled by aesthetics and art that will serve the popular spirit of the demos by making politics imitate the theatrical. But Rancia's enthusiasm should not be taken at face value. The limitations of this strategy of affirming the theatrical becomes visible in the staging of Ubu and the Truth Commission. By referencing Jerry, Ubu and the Truth Commission take up the responsibility that Benjamin and Rancia attempt in their respective aesthetic interventions. Sherry's presence invokes these prior discourses about aesthetics and freedom. It is also the impulse that drives Ubu and the Truth Commission. This is more than a play that seeks to account for the past. Like Wally Shoinka's King Babu, which incidentally also playfully remakes Jerry's Ubu into Babu, the opportunity to mock and ridicule power is not lost to a theatrical politics. And thus we return once again to the Rancierian reversal between spectator and actor. That's the fun bit. When the spectators are endowed with the qualities of the actor as they decry the emperor with no clothes. Beyond the enfolding, though, of the popular into, the, into theatrical politics that Rancia champions and which Ubu and the Truth Cam Commission emulates, the anarchic catastrophe of violence persists as a problem. This is a problem that Ubu and the Truth Commission struggles to resolve. The problem that the play confronts is that the TRC is already set up as a theater. This is a view that both Catherine Cole and Rustam Barucha have articulated in their respective studies on the performative quality of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Rather than offer us a view on freedom, the script of Ubu and the Truth Commission is regrettably entrapped in the theatricality and irresolution of the TRC. Specifically, what the play reveals is that theatrical politics was proving to be incapable of exceeding the scripts of violence handed down by apartheid. Ubu and the Truth Commission appears to have been snared in the very impasse of the TRC, unable to break through the constraints once identified by Walter Benjamin in his 1921 no, study on violence. They, as you may recall, Benjamin distinguishes between mythic and divine violence. Like his contemporary Siegfried, uh, Siegfried Krakauer, Benjamin believed that the aesthetic commitments inherited from the theater of the absurd would result in the collisions and shock necessary to cast freedom. Judging from Ubu and the Truth Commission, the TRC returns the question of freedom to the law. And this is Benjamin's point in the essay that law preserving violence ultimately defines the rise of fascism in Germany. Read along the grain of this argument, uh, sorry, so the TRC returns the question of freedom to the law, allowing little room for a theatrical politics to redefine the demos. In other words, this potential that both Benjamin and Rancia were pursuing in theatrical politics, that it might help us to get beyond the limits and constraints posed by violence, that this was showing up as a, as a huge limitation. Read along the grain of this argument, we might say that despite its effort, Ubu and the Truth Commission is unable to measure up to the expectations of the theatrical politics that Rancia advocates thereby showing that Rancia's expectations were inadequate for thinking the problem of violence. From the vantage point of a post-TRC condition, the aesthetic has largely come to mime the juridical paradigm of the TRC. This is observable in the painterly, cinematic, documentary, and musical repertoire of the post-apartheid post aesthetic practice. The TRC weighs heavily on the work of art. If the TRC's reach extends this far into the realms of art and aesthetics, and if we, are to if we are correct to assume that the TRC constrains an aesthetic contribution to the question of freedom, then we might mark the aesthetic as a particular crisis of the post-apartheid. 
In other words, what I'm suggesting is that the aesthetic now is the repertoire of the TRC, that what we see in every iteration of aesthetic practice is a remaking of the form and content of the TRC. And I just want to anecdotally say that trying to do a documentary on an Elvis impersonator in the town of Elvis has simply revealed that everybody thinks when they're on camera that they're at the TRC. Um, and so that's where that thought derives from, that in fact, I suppose most those of us who have to face undergraduate students now see the lecture theater as a TRC of some sort or the other. So as much as Ubu and the Truth Commission attempts to exceed this limit, and Jane Taylor is here, and so, she, so I'm a bit anxious about making this criticism because this is the first time she's hearing this, it ultimately succumbs to the very constraints inherited from the Truth Commission. In short, the post-apartheid aesthetics, insofar as it is distinguishable in its potential to overturn apartheid reason, now almost entirely abides by the terms and, and juridical conditions and forms of the TRC. The TRC, in conclusion, has proven that the struggle against the scl sclerotic liberalism that refuses to adapt to a changing world has morphed into, a new, into newer forms of neoliberalism that have emptied freedom of meaning. The danger now exists for a rise of speculative leftism that will leave the very concept of freedom imperiled. The only recourse for an aesthetic theory that will prove capable of mobilizing freedom is one that takes the question of the aesthetic as a singular and specific question of our times. This is a task that will require confidence and dedication. Perhaps our first port of call is to ask whether we might craft an aesthetic theory that is coherent enough to reframe the meaning of the TRC beyond the familiar victim-perpetrator narrative. Such an aesthetics might set to work on recasting the idea of freedom that reclaims reconciliation, post-apartheid subjectivity, and post-apartheid freedom as the very opportunities to think the livable life. Thank you. Thank you for the Thank really you. fascinating and intriguing and stimulating and engaging <coughs> presentation. You know, yesterday we were meeting a group and we were talking about the TRC and the fact that, you know, there was this imagined future of reconciliation that it seems everyone believed, you know, or, or most people believed or at least hoped that it would work, that we would have a future of reconciliation and peace and so on. And that now that we are at that future, you know, 30 years after the TRC, that that did not happen. And so could you say a little bit, elaborate a little bit on the role of the aesthetics? I think I like this image, and in a way there are people here who are really, who have been speaking about this. I see my friends from UNSW, they, we've been engaging on this question of the role of the aesthetics in imagining freedom, in imagining a, a, a new kind of publics, you know, after post-apartheid, after apartheid. So what, what, would, what, what does that look like? What, where, where does that happen? Where are the engagements with the aesthetics that will you know, inspire us to, to really find a, a new way of engaging with the idea of freedom? Yeah, thank you, Pumla. I mean, look, I, I, I'd answer it in two ways. One is that the tradition that Ubu and the Truth Commission partakes in is the tradition that has left us with a vast and expansive library of the aesthetic as a contested, as a field that contests power in one form or the other. And that's what I was trying to map in some sense, that Ubu and the Truth Commission is a product of a lineage of, of interventions in the realm of the aesthetic. And of course, the most significant of that for me was the intervention that arose in the 1930s on the, on the eve of the emergence of German and Italian fascism, but mostly German fascism that gave us the potential of critical theory to rethink the aesthetic question. Mm. And there you know Adorno's famous aesthetic theory was an attempt to reconfigure the relation of subject and object, which today I think, you know, and Achille has made this point recently in an interview, is becoming increasingly catastrophic in, the, in a global sense. So you think about new technologies and the human, when all of these instrumentalities that we have today have really 
I don't want to use the word trumped because we shouldn't be trumped, but has almost trumped us in kind of rethinking this question. Uh, so I think that there's one strand to this argument that will have to take hold of a longer history and genealogy uh, of the emergence of, a, of an aesthetic theory that unfortunately is now showing up as inadequate. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so I would say that you know what we need is a re-energized rethinking of the question of aesthetics and what we, want, what we might want to work with in the space of the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. wow. The second answer, the, that I, the second direction I'd take this is really to think a little bit about national narratives. And you know, Dor Doris Somner has this wonderful book called Foundational Fictions, in which she argues that Latin American nationalism was largely configured around the romance novel. Now, if you think about military dictatorships and the reference for all military dictatorships as the romance novel, there's, you know, for the rom romantics in the room, I mean, it's a really worrying, uh, it's, a, it's something to worry about. But I've been trying to think about what are the foundational fictions of South African nationalism. And quite clearly, what I think the TRC did was to put in place uh, what I call a very weak narrative of love. And I, I'm, you know, Anki is a friend and a colleague, but I'm being, I'm, you know, it's good to argue with yes. friends. Um, yes, it's, yes. it's also good to run from friends, <laughs> right. you know, once you've made the argument. Right. But, but Anki, in a sense, you know, has in Country of My Skull, which was the text that mediated the international reception of the TRC, had put in place a fairly weak narrative, you know, that then became this film with Juliet Benoche and, who was it? Uh, someone, yeah. uh, it was a really ridiculously made film, a ridiculous film. I mean, so what and I she actually also agrees. She agrees. Yes. She, I mean, yes. I know she, she, that's one, we do agree on that. And I think that Ubu and the Truth Commission was, I mean, I'm not sure what Jane would say, but in my reading, would par is parodying the weak narrative of love that founds the South African national narrative. So we didn't even get to romance, not the romance novel. We just went for weak love as the basis for, for reconciliation in this kind of bizarre idiom of interracial love. And you know what that failed to do was to think the stakes of freedom in the midst of what was being constituted as a kind of foundational fiction. So I think that if we, I'm, I mean, I'm not certain in my own thinking here, this is work that I'm, I'm wanting to, to undertake, but I think you know, we ought to be thinking along those lines, both the long history of aesthetic theory and where we are with it now. And secondly, you know, what are the foundational fictions that kind of were, were used to prop up uh, the national narrative? That's a really great answer. Thank you very much. And so now we invite you to uh, raise your own questions and comments. Yes, uh, John, yes. John. John. Mesh, thank you very much. Um, I'm, no, I wanted to ask you about your use of the word freedom. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what you mean. Yeah. Because Adorno, as I understand him, is looking for a way <clears throat> to, to think freely in, in, in an oppressive society, to think sort of beyond the norms that determine um, life in, in the world he lived right. in. But, but I think there's also the wider context of, <clears throat> of freedom from suffering. So I, I just want, I wanted to ask you to explain a little bit more how you're using that word. Yeah. So I'm using it at the moment uh, with a little caution, partly because it's such a tangled uh, concept. I mean, it names political projects on this continent in ways that deliver precisely its opposite. So it's a completely bizarre repertoire that you have where people would argue uh, you know, that they are part of a freedom movement, you know, or then later liberation struggle, but that would you know, work out that term in very antithetical ways. I would say that we, we're dealing with a fairly sclerotic notion of freedom, and that comes from a liberalism that has run aground. I mean, if we look at the US just yesterday, and you look at the <laughs> catastrophe that awaits us in the world without even being part of that conversation, that's an example of a sclerotic liberalism that is taking hold in the world. Um, I know I needed to make that comment because Mark has a camera here, so yes. I, I needed to use the opportunity to, to make that point. The, the, so I'm saying that you know, the aesthetic must have a different stake in the question of freedom. And that's why I think you know, what I'm interested in, in the work that Handspring Puppet Company, for example, offers us, or that Jane and William have given us in the idea of the processual, is to reinvent the terms by which we approach the question of aesthetics as the very grounds for rethinking and remaking freedom. Mm 
So this idea that we're going to inherit a concept here that will be available to us is now a sign that you know we are in a very depleted state. You know? And in fact, what has happened is that in what I'm calling left, uh, a speculative leftism is that we've in some sense surrendered and conceded the ground of freedom. Now this country has a very interesting relation to that term because when it gets mobilized in the 1940s, in the academic freedom debates at UCT and WITS, it becomes the foundation of what is cited in America in the Frankfurter Judgment uh, in 1947, 48. So in other words, the first four pages of the academic freedom statement at UCT and WITS, claiming that they were not apartheid universities. <laughs> and you know that, of course, that was just, you know, that got them nowhere that that argument became the precedent for, for the discussion on academic freedom in the, uni uh, in the US. It's in a, an, a judgment by Justice Frankfurter, and I, I mean there's a longer story to this that Adam Seitz and others have, have written about. But what you find there is a kind of narrowing of the gauge on freedom. It's complete juridical formation, you know, so it becomes a legal concept that's adjudicated through the kind of instrumentalities of law and not available to aesthetics that had in fact held the most profound sense of that term through the 19th and early 20th century. So what I'm saying is that, you know, is there a way for the aesthetic to reclaim this term? And then for us to have a conversation about what it is that we might want to mobilize in relation to that term. So since I mentioned handspring in the earlier and didn't finish that book, what, what strikes me as interesting there is the relation between subject and object that is reconstellated in that, uh, in that repertoire of work. So Faustus in Africa, Wojciech on the Highfeld, I mean, these are classic texts of, European theatrical, of the European the theatrical tradition that are subtly and sometimes pointedly reworked into reimagining and recrafting something like the concept of freedom. So I'm basically asking, what is the work that the academy, that the academy might set itself? And I would say that it would do better rather than grumbling about the corrosive effects of neoliberalism and managerialism <laughs> and you know how many bruises we carry as a consequence of that, is to set to work on this concept through the kind of grids of aesthetic theory. I don't know if that, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much yeah. for that, um, if I can say, cerebral presentation. And um, I do have three questions. Great. And if you don't mind. Uh, the first one is more like a stylistic question. So you were talking about the theater of absurd, which I really find, you know, it's very present in the in the play because I've watched the play too. But also, what I see is the is is a kind of battled Brecht kind of you know um, um, style also in, in in the play in the sense that because of the use of you know slapstick comedy humor and parody and all of that, somehow it achieves a kind of deep. deep what Beto Brecht calls a defamiliarization effect, where we all know that the TRC is a very emotionally charged performance, but this one is trying to kind of, you know, separate emotionally, you know, the audience from the emotional narrative of the TRC, which William Kentridge actually says that also the translators in the play, they, their voice was very dispassionate, and the puppets are wooden puppets in order to avoid a horror of pornography and all of that. <coughs> I, I, I just wonder what, yeah, if you've, if you've considered the, the Beethoven's Brecht kind of, you know, idea of defamiliarization mm -hmm. in regards to this um, play. And then the second question is, because I've watched the play, the last scene actually, I find it really, you know, striking in the sense that, uh, you know, in a very humorous way, the mics were trying to, you, you know, yeah, um, who was saying something and the mics were, you know, going up and down. And what he was saying, if we look at it in the light of you know reconciliation conversations we are having today, and also the recent uh, um, FW the Flags you know proclamation, I feel like there is a lot of resonance there, and and I I just wonder what you you know say about that. And the third question is, you know you started your presentation by saying that uh, Alfred Alfred um, Jerry. Ta Jerry. Um, in, in the late 1980s, in the late 19th century, this this play kind of you know um, it, it was it was it affected the sensibilities of the upper class, right? And today, if we look at the play, 
in, in the South African context, which I've actually followed in a way, doesn't it look a little bit elitist, very mm -hmm. ironically, because it looks like the play has a lot of, you know, currency among the intellectuals, but not really, you know, among, you know, the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great yeah, question. Yeah. Um, look, the, the Brecht is absolutely critical in it, any genealogy of, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the theatrical, especially when he's thinking about the work of the theatrical or theatrical politics, as I'm putting it, in, in the context of Africa. And I think, you know, much of the attention in theatre studies in, in South Africa, and I'm not a theatre studies person per se, but in my delving in and out of it, quite clearly Brechtian uh, kind of theater is the way to think about the, uh, the realm of theatrical politics. So just two examples. I was thinking about the worker plays that were done in Natal. Uh, one was called um, The Long March, which was about the BTR song called Strike, um, which parodied Thatcher in that moment of the Dunlop uh, uh, strike. And the second one was Bambata's Children. I think both were pr products of culture and working life at the University of Natal then. Those were very precisely Brechtian works. So, you know, in thinking about what other kind of interventions theatrically were unfolding in the space, and why it is that the question of fascism is always something that is available to Kentridge to think the problem of apartheid as the aftermath of, of, of fascism. I was suggesting that perhaps there's a way in which those four plays that get made in the 1990s uh, Ubu and Truth Commission is one of them, Faustus in Africa, Wojciech on the High Felt, and I think the Confessions of Zeno, right Jane? Yeah. Those four plays, in some sense, wrestle with the problem not of the kind of colonial project, but of fascism and its aftermath. Mm. And in the sense that's, you know, I would certainly in the longer study return to Brecht in some form or the other. But for now, the Ubu and the Truth Commission and both Faustus, and Faustus really engages Marx's uh, 1850s essay in the Grundrisch on the human and the machine. What's it called? Fragment on the machine. Um, so that's where you know, he kind of goes to. And there's a little Goethe uh, a quote from Goethe in the Marx essay about the cellar rat that has become an interesting kind of point of discussion. So a long-winded way to say that I haven't dealt with Brecht here, in part because I'm wanting to come to it at some point. But it is, you know, defamiliarization is something I need to think about. And, and the scene you're pointing to where the mic is kind of reminded me a lot of Chaplin's great dictator, where Chaplin is speaking into this technological instrument and conveying a kind of humanist uh, plea for, for the senses to, to take hold of that moment. Um, except in this one, you know, the mic kind of it flips around and it, as soon as he lies, it kind of tilts, uh, tilts backwards and so on. It's a brilliant moment in that play. And so I will think about defamiliarization. The puppet for me is an emotional prosthesis. And Handspring thinks about the object of the puppet as an emotional prosthesis. Mm -hmm. So it is actually the object that is called into play as a site of transferring the kind of difficult questions of you know, embodied pain and so on and so forth. And you know, in the work that we do, with Jane and others in a rural community, the question of the object has become a very important question for us to think. Of. The, the second, so that's the microphone as well. And the, the, the what was the third question? Sorry, I had my notes. Oh. Um, irony of elitism. You know, oh, so I you know, really think that the transference is not between elite and subaltern there. And you know, I have a deep interest in that transference. So I'm not denying that there's a transference that is happening. I think the cinematic is an interesting way to think about what is unfolding um, in the space of, of, of that production. And in William Kendridge's work, I mean, the cinematic is a powerful uh, idiom through which he thinks. What the cinema does, it produces a kind of kinesthetic education that one has to take hold of. Um, and, and I think that what we're seeing in this movement of this tradition that Jerry inaugurates is actually the birth of the cinematic. And what I would like to think about there, and maybe we can think together about it at some point, is what it does to the configuration of memory. And you know, mm -hmm. here we're in the kind of discussion of Bergson and others. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, we need a longer history of apartheid since you arrived at that point. And we need a different history of apartheid. 
And we need a, a history of apartheid that will allow us to think about the uncanny returns of race. Mm. Because, and, and here I would say that, you know, we have come to think this problem through standpoints of various kinds. And it's proving extremely unhelpful in many instances to think them entirely through the standpoint. So I'm not entirely disavowing standpoints. What I do think is that we ought to be able to think about it in relation to what Stuart Hall once put, Hall once put forward as the idea of race as a free-floating signifier that attaches. And to think about where and how it is attaching across the kind of spectrum of time. So I really think that the problem we're sitting with, and this is part of the argument of the book, is that we have a critique of apartheid that has been found wanting. So um, if I understood correctly your uh, concerns with Uber, it's to do something with the fact that you say the play maybe gets carried away uh, with its own theatricality uh, and weaving its own fictions. Did I, did I sort of hear that correctly? Uh, well, since Jane has now arrived, I'm going to say no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well, just, just stay with me anyway. No, no, I think, you, I think there is some of that, but I, there's right. another part to that. So, so um, I'm interested in that because if you look at uh, some of the musical responses, you know, I'm thinking about Philip Miller's Fantasia, mm -hmm. um, he starts from the premise that uh, he really wants to stick to an aesthetic of realism. So he does not, the only kind of theatricality that really encroaches on his, or encroaches on his uh, cantata is the TRC as theater. Uh, but for the rest, for him, it's very important to almost restage hearings as they happened and not to allow fiction and theatricality to interfere with actual testimonies. And I wondered whether you wanted to comment on uh, that alternative route of an aesthetic realism, which, which I find problematic in many ways. Yeah, again, a great question. I was going to say, you know, so my initial response about, you know, Jane being in the room is obviously wrong, because in a sense I do want to think about the excessive theatricality. And, and you, know, you know, when I think about what, say, Dadaism offered us, as part of the longer critique of apartheid, there have been I elements of what we've drawn out of that tradition mm -hmm. that have proved incredibly powerful, but also warring at some point. So I'm thinking about, you know, conversations we've had with the work of the Gugulective, with Kemang Walehulere and a whole range of other artists, you know, who were inspired at some point, you know, with thinking about what Dadaism had done uh, that would enable a, a different rendering of the problem of apartheid. Um, look, I. I, I, I'm not very, I know Philip's work, and I, you know, I know that you, one work we collaborated on was the African Choir production. Mm. Um, and that involved, you know, two figures, uh, Charlotte Makeke and um, Katie Manier. And I had a graduate student, uh, Tozama April, who was writing on uh, Charlotte Makeke, is writing on Charlotte Makeke. And so it was very important to think with her about what that, uh, choir reproduction look like. Mm. I'm, I'm still not convinced, for example, in the African choir that we've exceeded the scripts of the TRC. You know, in some sense, there's still the theatricality mm. that, so that's the one work I draw on to respond to your question. Um, I'm not sure how to respond to the question on aesthetic realism. I'd have to give it a lot more thought. Um, but what I do want to say is that that's probably the weakest part of the argument that I put together is, and I did reference musicality as one place in which the TRC is being created as a repertoire. I'm drawing straight from uh, Steve Gordon's argument at a conference on black aesthetics in which he said, you know, South African music is getting stuck in repertoire, and that that repertoire is, you know, signaled by the way in which the testimonial has functioned mm -hmm. as a cornerstone of how we think our way into the present. So, so with a little bit of a rain check, and I, I'd love to see whether I can answer that more fully with some thought. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd think a little bit ho uh, more about, you know, how to approach the question of music. Um, I haven't done anything with soundtrack, and as I know, in all of these productions, what, you know, there have been great thinkers of sound that have been involved in all of these productions. Warwick Sony, um, Philip, uh, James Phillips, who passed away, after the production of Ubu and the Truth Commission, two weeks after the production in Grahamstown, when I, or what is now Makanda, when I first saw it. Um, you know, so, so I need to think this question much more seriously. I haven't thought soundtrack. 
uh, into this into this argument yet. This is that field. She did her PhD on Philip Miller's. Ah, so yes. we have, you know, maybe you can you can guide me on how I might need to think about this. Um, quite clearly, I, uh, uh, you know, there's a need for me to to find some jumping off points. It's a, it's a conversation we must have, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. More questions, please. We have a few more minutes before we break for two more questions. Jane, you must say something. Okay, <laughs> you must, you must really say something. We, we, we demand that you say something. She's <laughs> <laughs> come with a bag of rotten but, eggs. But, but <laughs> Andrea, please, Andy. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank I, you. I wanted to ask you if religion has entered your thinking as a construct, as a sort of form of theatre in a way, because there's a sense. It's interesting. We've been here today. There it was as the justification for apartheid, and there was Bishop Tutu and Alex Borain as leading the TRC, and this notion of love that you speak of as a, as, a, as a foundation for reconciliation. And I just wondered as you were talking whether religion in any way or religiosity in any way influenced your yeah. thinking. You know, on the eve of the first hearings, David Beresford had an article in the Mail and Guardian at the time in which he probingly asked and searchingly asked whether the TRC was theater, was it a religious mm -hmm. ceremony, was mm -hmm. it, you know, he was trying to work through all the permutations of what this might be mm -hmm. um, in the confusing way in which those first days mm -hmm. of the t uh, commission unfolded. And, and I thought long and hard about, you know, why it is, you know, the TRC through Catherine Cole and Rustam Barucha in particular, uh, Performance and Terror, Rustam's uh, book, but also Adam Seitz's uh, wonderful book, which I was telling someone else about, called uh, The Impossible Machine uh, on a Genealogy of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's a wonderful book which really thinks very hard at the kind of legal precedence for commissions of inquiry and, you know, the way in which the colonial script is re, -en you know, is re curated in the space mm -hmm. of the uh, TRC. Mm -hmm. And you know he does ask us to think very hard about the the question of limits and taking care of the limits of the TRC. But more than religion, I was interested in questions of ritual through Rustam and through Rustam's work in particular. And and yeah, you know, through a circuitous way, in a different moment in my life, as Adebayo will tell you, when I worked on a book called uh, on the deaths of Hinsa book, which is about a. Uh, a healer diviner, Nicholas Tlaleka, who goes in search of a skull of the Tosa King Hinsa and returns to South Africa in the, at the height of the TRC with the skull. And I was arguing there that something about 1834 and 1994 rhymed but, that, but did not produce any reason. And so I was trying to think those two things and Brett Bailey's in Mambo Jumbo arrived. And you know the actor that played Nicholas Tlaleka and that performance just passed away I think yesterday. Uh, that that production, I saw it with Nao Moyanga, and Nao was worrying about the way in which ritual was being performed as theatre. And so, you know, and, and I was fascinated with the word ritual because it seemed that what was at play in the TRC were certain kinds of rituals of mourning and, and accounting and so on. And I wondered about those convergences of the ritual rather than the purely religious, uh, because I know there were debates. I mean, there was a meeting in Athlone. I was involved in the student movement in 85. And there was a meeting about the Trojan Horse Massacre. And Dalla and a number of other people came to speak there. And I, I think it was someone got up in the audience. I mean, I know who it is. I won't mention names because there's a camera here. But said, you know, you are expecting me to forgive, you know, as if I was a Christian. But what if I was Muslim and I had a different idea of forgiveness? So I know those debates have played out. I was more interested in what ritual was doing in the space of, of the TRC. So I, I, I would say that, you know, there's some work that we need to do in relation to what uh, Umla was calling the archive of the TRC, that the layers and textures to this dynamic that has unfolded, that notwithstanding all the quibbles about whether it succeeded or failed, and, you know, that's the, no, that's the way in which people approach this now, is that actually that might not be the best way to think about this. This might be precisely that archive that got constituted in 1834, and remember, that was the eve of the abolition of slavery. But that archive was also on the eve of the Aboriginal Commission in Britain 
which was going to find out how native populations were being treated around the world. Remember, it's the British Commission of Inquiry. That archive comes about because of a collection of documents, that Ruland Street archive, collection of documents to prove that the settlers had mistreated native populations. So the birth of that archive and the TRC archive, there's a sequence there that we might have to think about very, very carefully. So again, you know, I think within the textures of the TRC, we need to look at other ways of thinking of this project beyond the victim-perpetrator narrative and beyond the kind of spiraling kind of problems that we, we, we deal with when we think about failure, success. So at the recent colloquium, a symposium on Kentridge's exhibition at the Zeitz Marker, you know, Anki was saying that, you know, uh, the commission had failed. And I was saying, you know, actually, this is seeped into every discourse in our lives. I mean, when you talk to anybody, it's like they offer you a testimony. I mean, I don't think there's a... Re I mean, Albi Sachs wrote about, you know, spring is rebellious about what, you know, whether people talk about the white working class when they go to bed. I think people do talk in the terms of the TRC when they go to bed now. So it's that effective. You know, it has really, really structured our lives. So I don't know if that's a, it, a, it's a, again, another circuitous response, but I do think we've got more work to do rather than less work. You know, I, I really like, I think that what you say is just so important. And you mentioned Dala, you know, Omar, when in 1997, we had just had our first hearing yeah. earlier, the previous year, and we were in the U.S. on a panel with Dala. Right. And he made exactly this point. He said, the import, because people are saying, you know, why are you doing this, especially African Americans? Why are you bringing this? Why are you reconciling? And, and Dala said, you know, to this audience, it's not, it, reconciliation is important, but what is important is what this work will mean 30 years down the line, the questions that you will have to ask, because it's not as if the commission is answering questions about the state of where we are after apartheid. The, the, the greatest questions, the most challenging questions will be 30 years down the line, and the commission will be a site for exactly those kinds of mm. questions. I mean, and, and, and here you are in a way, you know. The only criticism of Dala is that yeah. he was upset with me for studying history, not law. <laughs> 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 and now he will yeah. be proven right. Right, there you come there, yeah, yeah. <laughs> delighted to be here. Um, the one thing that I can say is I'm extremely pleased to be able to say or to know that at this point what the play means is not my fault. What the play means is constituted by the minds in the room. So that's an incredible uh, grace that uh, engagement means. Um, the only thing I can really talk about with th that may interest you is the process. So I'm interested in your question about the performances of the testimony. Um, and obviously there are a number of reasons why uh, puppetry arts became the idiom that we engaged with. And that is precisely because with a, a puppet performer one always knows that it's kind of asserting for itself that it is not the site of origin of the event which it is describing, whereas the actor's obligation is to erase the distance between the character being performed and the performer. And a puppet is always saying, I'm speaking on behalf of another. And so that's also part of what was so interesting in the, um, the translation process, is very often in those performances, the sight of trauma that you m witnessed immediately on stage wasn't necessarily the person who is telling their story because they've made some kind of representation of that event themselves. They've either told themselves, they've told a loved one, they may have told an immediate community what happened to them, what kind of violation they experienced. The interpreter is inside the experience of that experience at the moment that they are describing it. They're seeing it for the first time and voicing it in the same moment. So the interpreter is a kind of a screen that is reflecting the trauma that they are undergoing in speaking on behalf of another. So the kind of the charge, the emotional mobility on that stage is that you have a person testi testifying, you have a puppet 
uh, representing that person testifying and you have an interpreter who is experiencing what that testimony is about. So it's an incredibly diffuse and I'm, you know, really, as I work in puppetry arts, increasingly interested in the, the multi-textured nature of the holding of the obligation, that what happens in that process is a collective endeavor, that there are multiple subjectivities that make any kind of transaction of event and um, transmission of an event. It belongs to all of us. Um, one of the interesting things also about the vocal pattern is that an interpreter <coughs> doesn't know if a sentence is the end of an idea. So uh, the interpreters tend, as a kind of a habit um, which I imagine they've had taught into them, is they'll produce an interpretation and end it with a rising inflection. So there's always a suspended action because they don't know where the action has ended in the mind of the person who is thinking the event. So someone will say, he came into the room. And so there's the possibility of that going to an elsewhere. It's not a natural habit of thought, certainly not in South African accents. In some accents, they are more inflected to the upward um, ending. Um, but with you know, um, South African languages, there tends to be a much stronger sense of a linguistic closure. So part of what we were interested in is that you would have someone speaking in a pattern like that over which you have someone speaking in a pattern like that because they're listening at the same time as they're speaking. So a lot of this is you know, fairly technical work because one is interested in whatever is happening in that space collectively or we are going to be responsible um, for the transmission of meaning. Thank you so much. There's one last question. It's a comment and, and, and question. You spoke um, in your response to Adebayo about the uncanniness of the return of race. And I wondered whether you, you had transgenerational images of this uncanny transmission and return, you know, in a kind of psychoanalytic meaning of the word return, or, or did you or have another uncanny. vision? Or no, the, no. Yeah, of the uncanny. No, I'm, I'm very much within the kind of, you know, uh, in, in the psychoanalytic and, mm. and the Freudian kind of uh, marker there. Um, you know, what I would like to, I suppose, how I would respond if I was mm. to think about, you know, an instance to think this question. Mm. Mm. And um, it's something I've been writing about. Jane did a lecture the other day in which she referenced it. Mm. Uh, you know, for Wood's dissertation, which was done here, mm. was titled The Blunting of Emotion in Translation. Mm. I don't know what mm. the Afrikaans is. Um, and he... You know, that was about psychological susceptibility. I mean that, so, you know, the work that got done there was to kind of map out forms of psychological susceptibility, which then ended up in a postdoctoral moment in Leipzig. Hmm. And, you know, they, they were working with this machine called the Rausberg Memory Apparatus. And the only one, John, you'll be very interested to know this, the only machine left, only one of its kind left, is at University of Toronto in some collection of useless objects or something like that at Toronto. Um, and that machine was used to test emotive responses to shock and, you know, empathy and so on and so forth. The article then appears in the American Journal of Psychology. So quite clearly it has traveled. And I've been trying to track who's reading mm. the American Journal of Psychology in the U.S. because quite clearly this is the moment when segregation mm. is taking a particular kind of turn. Um, and so, so, you know, there's a way in which when I'm talking about thinking the technogenesis of race, you know, and a way in which a whole Stuart Hall-like formulation might help us to rethink this problem, mm -hmm. uh, we would have to think the technological mediation much more seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I want to insert into the longer discussion of the question of, you know, the uh, uncanny returns of race beyond its kind of Freudian references, uh, is to think the question of technology much more centrally. 
and to think apartheid as a particular orientation towards the technology, to, towards the technological. I think we've missed this. When I say the critique of apartheid has been found one thing, it is that the technological is mm -hmm. central to its kind of, uh, its work and instrumentality. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm simply wanting to, to say that, you know, the field of, you know, the critical field here needs massive expansion. I mean, and, and if, you know, whatever incoherence might have filtered through this presentation is to try and say we can no longer re come to rest with a narrowed view on the party, which is pro producing kinds of effects that I don't think we can, we can manage, you know. Um, neither are we going to undo and unravel the legacies and problematics of race. And having worked and grown up with someone like Dalla, I knew that, you know, very early on that what our project here was, was not simply to constitute, you know, the new as a kind of form of state power, but to unravel the legacies of race in a fundamental and purposeful way. You know, Premier, you have been as clear as a bell. Yeah. <laughs> <I don't> know. <laughs>